Well, thank you all for coming out today. I know there are a plethora of options for Festivus talks to attend, so I'm pleased that you've made this one. I'll try not to bore you too terribly, and I will try not to go over time. I feel a little bad that I'm following such an awesome presentation. Well, not bad, it was a great presentation, but you know, we had uh, the members, cast members of the Laramie Project, and they're all like great actors, and they were talking about an emotionally moving work of art, and I'm gonna be talking to you about archeology, span so just prepare for yourself for a little bit of a shift here, if uh, indeed you already were at the previous session. So uh, Johnny McLean dropped by my office uh, the other month to inform me that there was a tradition, which I was unaware of, that if you uh, were the Board of Trustees winner from the previous year, you were then supposed to talk at the Festival of Excellence. And I guess the idea was you would talk about what you had been awarded the award for. And I thought, oh no, no one wants to hear about strategic planning for like, you know, 60 minutes, that would just not be awesome. And then I thought, well, maybe I could talk about what I did while I was uh, on sabbatical in, in Peru. That would be marginally more interesting, but most of my time was spent with colleagues analyzing bags of broken ceramic sherds and trying to revise a ceramic seriation sequence. And I also thought that probably didn't have a lot of broad public appeal. So I decided to do um, instead a topic that is kind of near and dear to my heart, and it's something I probably won't get sad, I may get a little angry as I talk about these things, so I'm going to uh, apologize to you if that happens. But the preservation of the archaeological record. Um, this is something all of my colleagues uh, at the last year's Society for American Archaeology meetings and I were chatting about when I attended that. We uh, set up a fabulous uh, little private Facebook group called Archaeologists for a Just Future, which started out with only about 120 of us, all members of Berkeley's graduate program, and by three months it had morphed into over 4,500 members. Uh, and that was about a year and a half ago, and it was a way for us to communicate our increasing concerns about what we saw as threats to the archaeological record, primarily in North America. And so what I'm going to try to do today is to summarize what I think some of these threats are, and then maybe try to brainstorm a little bit about ways that my profession uh, can be a little bit better about trying to protect these archaeological resources and get more support from our communities to do so. So I'll start by telling you a little bit about what some of the ethical responsibilities for archaeologists are in the United States. I'll then go on to discuss just a few of the myriad of problems and threats that are facing the archaeological record here. And then after that, I'm gonna kind of explore, because you know I actually primarily work in South America for my scholarship. I'm gonna take a look at uh, different perspectives on how we should conserve our heritage from, the, from England, the United Kingdom, and also from Peru, and see if, I can, if we can't steal a few of their ideas. And then we're gonna to return to the United States and try to talk about, um, and maybe brainstorm, I'm gonna ask for a little bit of audience participation here. What can we do to get people a little bit more concerned about protecting what is a vanishing resource in many cases? This is not a, this is not a renewable resource. Archaeology, once it's gone, it's out of the ground, it's destroyed, it's sort of gone forever. So, so anyway, without further ado, let me uh, start here. So I'm not gonna go through all of the ethical laws here, but I did want to point out that there are a few, which I've highlighted in yellow for you, that are especially pertinent to today's talk. So if you're a member for the Society for American Archaeology and a registered professional archaeologist such as I am, these are things that you are expected to do by your professional board or you will be censured. And they include stewardship. Stewardship means that you have an obligation to the archaeological record itself. Not just the people, not just the people who want to develop it, you have an obligation to try to preserve the past for posterity. And they put that at the very start of the ethical responsibilities. So that probably has a certain primacy in terms of what we're talking about. The other uh, really important one here is accountability. You are not, again, just responsible to the archeological record or to the people who might be employing you. You're also accountable to stakeholders who are affected, who might be descendant communities of those archeological sites that you're excavating or who may live in the local area who have other vested interests in it. And that can be difficult to negotiate. Uh, and then we have public education and outreach. And I think this is kind of the key. I know as a teacher, I'm probably expected to say that, but I think this is what it really comes down to in terms of how we're going to convince people that this is an important thing to do, um, how to take care of it. So 
the second kind of overly information slide, and then don't worry, you get lots of pretty pictures to look at it a little bit here, but uh, is uh, some important cultural heritage laws. There are a ton of them, and there are not like uh, standardized laws that are applied across the globe. Uh, or even across the nation. I mean, there are a few that are federal, but many are on the state and local level. And so it's not just as easy as, you know, uh, we're going to excavate something to save it. You really have to kind of figure out if it's under threat, if the site is considered significant, and then figure out which federal laws are going to apply. So I just wanted to say that. And if you have a site on your private property as an archaeologist working in North America, I can't go in there and seize that land from you. I just want to say that outright because I think there's a lot of fear and misconception about, you know, people think that we're sort of agents of the federal government and we're going to go out and take people's private property away from them and that is not our role. But these are, again are some of the major laws and the one that I've highlighted in here in yellow is the one that is probably currently most under threat and we're going to talk a little bit about that. So that's the um, Antiquities Act which was passed by Teddy Roosevelt in 1906. And it is responsible for creating most of the fabulous, or at least being the first step in creating most of the national parks we enjoy. But it actually, a good chunk of it is dedicated specifically to talking about the importance of archaeological resources. So we'll come back to that, and uh, but again, the pertinent language is under here. Um, okay. But I want to start off with, again, a little bit of audience participation here before I start getting into some nitty gritty. So, I have a pretty good sense, and my 4,000 colleagues on Archaeologists for a Just Future have a pretty good sense of things that we feel are threatening archaeological resources. That got us into a slightly heightened state of alarm in the last few years. But I'd like to put it out to the audience. What are some things that you think are putting sites at risk? Harry and then Thomas. <laughs> War. War, yeah. Actually, this is a huge issue in the uh, Middle East, obviously. Sites are getting bombed. Uh, ISIL has been uh, dealing in illegal antiquities trafficking in order to fund their war efforts. So yeah, that's definitely a big issue. Yes? Uneducation. Yeah, lack of education or understanding about why people should even care about that. I think that's a big issue. Thomas, yeah. Yes, and both of those are things I'll talk about. And, and both of them are actually issues here in Utah. So it's not just in the Near East, not just in Iraq. We actually have a pretty a big antiquities market here in Utah. And vandalism is certainly a big problem as well. Yeah, Mark. I would say construction is not just the fact that it's happening, but the way it's happening. Right, right, without maybe following proper procedures or what we would call um, conservation protocols. Yeah, they haven't necessarily done the necessary consultation work. So and you can see that with construction projects or pipelines or roads and we'll mention all of those things. Yes? Climate change. Climate change, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I have a friend who works in uh, Wyoming up in the mountains and she's, have, sites are constantly eroding out because of deglaciation due to uh, climate change. So in Peru, it's a big issue. They've had massive flooding if you may have uh, been following that in South America, and uh, several really important archaeological sites under vast threat due to that. So climate change is a big issue. Anything else that occurs to you? Yeah, in back, Don. What, I'm sorry? Tourism. Tourism, yeah, sometimes sites are loved to death. You know, you have to sometimes restrict numbers or make tough choices. So all of these are things that, you know, we could also talk about. I've just kind of uh, created a whole little list here. Some other things that you may not have thought of would be, um, the idea that we've had a ser series of recent attacks, I guess, on legislation. Uh, so I mentioned the Antiquities Act. That's, uh, we also have sort of, it seems to be fairly systematic attempts to weaken environmental protections, which actually include cultural heritage as part of that. Um, other things that may seem a little more tangential, which are also of alarm to at least my little Facebook group, are things like uh, Arizona's 2010 law trying to prohibit ethnic studies courses. Um, these were sort of very much directed towards Latino studies and Native American studies programs and, you know, archaeology tends to play a part in that uh, and it had sort of a dampening effect. And I think it also kind of broadened this division between this idea that there is an other past that we are not connected to if we are part of the dominant majority who maybe had ancestry from Europe. And so that's kind of a theme I think that has been coming out recently too. Uh, maybe not as much concern with things. Uh, mining. Uh, putting sort of, I guess, what we'd say economic development over and beyond things. I would also say anti-government attitudes seem to have increased a little bit in recent years. 
One reason I'm actually choosing to talk about this today, among other things I could have talked about, is I feel I'm sort of in a privileged position as a university professor. My job is hopefully relatively secure, uh, but I have friends who work at National Park, the National Park Service, or for federal agencies, and they really can't have their names associated uh, sometimes with speaking out against these attacks on legislation the same way that I perhaps can as somebody who works out of the country uh, in a big way. But nonetheless, um, people have been issued alerts that they shouldn't go out surveying alone or in small groups or at all in times because they're afraid that people might have guns pulled, pulled on them because they're seen as representatives of the federal government. This is not, as I said, entirely new. When I was a young archeologist in my early 20s working out in Eastern Oregon, which was also kind of a cowboy country, I had a gun pulled on me and my survey crew while we were uh, hiking on what was actually federal property doing a state mandated survey of archaeological remains but this you know cowboy came up I mean he even had like you know the mustache and everything and he said howdy howdy little missy you know I was kind of it was very much like out of an iconic western moment and uh, he then just sort of you know tapped his gun right there and said you'll need to be moving along now and, you know, that happened a few times. And, you know, I didn't push it. I thought, no, nah, they don't pay me enough hazard pay to deal with this. So, I'm, you know, I'm out of here. But um, these issues, then that was during the time of the sagebrush rebellion. And also time, you may remember the poor little spotted owl. Uh, there was a lot of deep hatred towards the spotted owl in Oregon where I was working because it represented all the evils of the environmental movement. And because we were federal employees, we were associated with that. And so we'd have people nearly try to run us off the road and yell out things like, hey, have you dug up any spotted owls lately? You know? So that kind of anti-government sentiment, my friends and I, who've been in archaeology for over 20 years, have seen rising again recently. And we can look to things like the Malheur occupation, I think, as a pretty uh, interesting example of that. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it. But I mentioned I was going to mention the uh, mention I was going to mention, but the Antiquities Act of 1906. Uh, this was again uh, first passed by Teddy Roosevelt. Every president, uh, really, from both political parties, has used it since. So it's not sort of restricted to one. It's been used over 150 times. Um, the five most visited national parks in the country all started off as national monuments created under this act. So it certainly has shaped our country in important ways. But it has also been used to protect archaeological resources. In fact, that was part of the original intent of the legislation. And we're hearing a lot about it recently in Utah uh, because of, how many of you heard of Bears Ears in the news? Yeah, or Gold Butte, just a little bit further down south. And there's a lot of uh, deep-seated feeling about this. And uh, again, this is one of those things that started to get me a little worried. And these are just a couple of pictures. Uh, from Bears Ears and showing the archaeology. So it's not just a ploy to, you know, create more mining, you know, to take mining areas away from people. There actually are a lot of archaeological resources there that need to be preserved, at least in my humble opinion. Um, so the 2016 uh, Republican Party platform actually called for amending the Antiquities Act and so that Congress and the states could block the president from pre declaring national monuments. So this was an official part of the party platform, and I'm not trying to get partisan here, but that was pretty disturbing to us, that one of the major parties in this country was advocating defanging probably the most important law that's protecting archaeological resources in this country. And then uh, what our very own Rob Bishop actually said it was the most evil act ever, that's a direct quote, and that it allowed the federal government to invade, also direct quote, and seize lands. Well, that's actually not true. If you read the original uh, wording of the Antiquities Act, which I had up there a few slides ago, it says that it only can be applied to federal lands. So to existing federal lands can be set aside. And that often gets sort of overlooked in these discussions of it. It's not creating new federal lands. It's being applied to existing ones and putting increased protections on them. Um, and again, it's kind of an interesting situation because on one hand, we have um, my local representatives speaking very harshly against things I firmly believe in. Yet, at the same time, we see the State Board of Tourism heavily promoting the Mighty Five. You know, these great national parks, four of which were initially created as part of the Antiquities Act. 
So, uh, so it'll be, and, you know, protests are, you know, when the, when the created Grand Teton, it also had a lot of protests against it at the time, and now people sort of generally recognize it as a good thing yeah, I mean, 50 years later, so maybe that will happen. So uh, legislation, and particularly the Antiquities Act, is one area. Another one are funding threats, and a lot of the discussion on my little Facebook group has revolved around this. Um, for example, let's see, there has been a proposed federal hiring freeze, so that's going to obviously impact a lot of archaeologists working for the government. Um, budget cuts to state historic preservation offices have been increasing over the last five to ten years. This is a picture of Kevin Jones, who until 2011, I believe, was the state archaeologist. He had an assistant state archaeologist, and then there was a state physical anthropologist. All of them were fired in one fell swoop not because they were not performing their duties, but probably because maybe they were performing them too well. Um, you know, and it was explained as budget cuts, though their salaries for the three of them were really hardly anything. And I have to say, Kevin is a really swell guy, if you ever get a chance to meet him. He's a great musician, writer, and a really uh, compelling archaeologist as well, and cares deeply about the past. But he kind of came under fire. You may, you may remember a UTA uh, sort of rail line project they were trying to put in up in your Draper. And they managed to put it right through the, one of the oldest archaeological sites in Utah, the first site to grow maize in the entire state of Utah, village site, destroyed. Uh, they actually got called out by the Army Corps of Engineers and the federal government for that. And they had to pay a really massive fine, which actually, interestingly enough, has a little tie to SUU, because then they had to agree to help preserve other archaeological sites around the state. And one of those was the Paraguna Mound site right up the road from us. So it ultimately led to the preservation of a site, but one really important irreplaceable site was destroyed. And for voicing some objections to this, what was probably a legal scheme, then maybe it was budget. But I don't think it was entirely budget. Uh, Kevin Jones and his staff were fired. Now, it would be one thing if it was just Utah, but it's not. The same thing happened in Colorado. We've seen uh, New Mexico has reduced their, basically, their heritage budget by over 30 percent. In the last few years, Nevada had a similar loss. We see it throughout the Mountain West, where people in charge of protecting archaeological resources and interpreting the past are losing their funding and losing their jobs. And that puts those sites at risk. Um, we mentioned illegal antiquities, not just in Iraq. This, does anybody recognize this is the Shumway collection over at the edge of Cedars uh, State Park in Blanding. Blanding has had a long and not very noble history of pot hunting. Uh, the most recent thing was in 2009, where they had the largest, one of the largest ever federal raids on pot hunters and arrested several people. And it ended very tragically. Two people ended up committing suicide after this. And, and I think the press at the time, at least here in the state of Utah, and I was running a field school uh, down in Kanab, was entirely in sympathy with the Blanding folks who were arrested, uh, which kind of drove me crazy. I mean, I agreed it was sad that some people took their lives. But when you looked at the scale of it, this wasn't just a few arrowheads people had found on public land. These people were robbing graves. <laughs> they were, I talked to somebody who was on part of the investigative team and she mentioned that there was a baby skeleton they pulled out from underneath somebody's bed that had turquoise pendant attached with it. That, that is going beyond, you know, oh, I, have, I have, want to appreciate the past that it would be desecration if it was done to most Anglo graves. But people were kind of giving it a pass, I think, in this case, because they viewed it as another culture. Anyway, this really impressive collection here was a formed from looted artifacts that were actually sold by the people who looted them to the county commissioner of San Juan County at that point, and then ended up in the museum. They now belong to the Navajo Nation, who's given them permission to be there. And it's kind of a tricky thing, because actually it was probably the uh, modern Puebloan peoples who have the closest relationship with these types of ceramics. But anyway, beyond that, they are currently safe and on display. And while they're beautiful, we know nothing about their context. We have no idea what they could tell us about the past. And they individually, I'm not trying to encourage you to go into the antiquities market, but they may look rather humble, but each of these would sell for hundreds, if not thousands of dollars internationally. So these people were doing it mostly for the money, not because they loved the past. And I feel like that's kind of an important thing to do. But that's been one of the few cases where it was actually uh, prosecuted. 
Now, the other thing we all mentioned when we were brainstorming was just sort of defacement of archaeological sites, and this occurs all the time. I just went on a field trip to Valley of Fire State Park, and I noticed that several of the uh, petroglyphs, which my, I had just visited a year and a half ago, had been damaged in the intervening year and a half. Uh, this is from Fremont Indian State Park. Note the bullet holes. Uh, probably, I'd say, a good like quarter of the rock art there has been shot up by people for fun. Uh, so that's something that you kind of see here. It's maybe not so obvious, but this site where my friend Donna Spangler and Jim Aiden, who some of you know, in Nine Mile Canyon, uh, are standing there. It's been dug out. Uh, there were several cysts and structures which were looted, and everything was disturbed, little corn cobs on the ground. So this is the typical thing. We're actually much more surprised now when we find a site that has not been touched. And there are only a few of those areas anywhere in the state. Range Creek Canyon is one of them. Uh, sometimes we have these really high cliffs which are really difficult to get up to and those haven't been touched because it requires a little bit too much work for people. So this intensification of threat is really increasing. And again, there is both anecdotal and uh, documentary evidence for that, that we are finding more and more destruction of archaeological sites. I'm not quite sure how to explain it. I think some of it has to do with use. More and more people are coming into these areas. I think some of it has to do with less law enforcement out there, fewer notices. I noticed a lot of like the former antiquities law, things they would put out in your sites have like are gone and no one's bothered to replace them, presumably due to budget cuts. They'll sometimes have one archeologist covering 20,000 acres of territory, so it's a little hard to uh, keep that under control. But I also think there seems to be, I don't know, maybe growing disrespect for the past in a way, where people do not feel connected, particularly to a Native American past, which they don't see as their own. Um, and that disturbs me. We also have what I'll just call ignorant destruction of sites, um, where people, I don't think, realize they've destroyed archaeological sites. That was one of the things that happened out at Malheur, though if you listen to the occupiers, they talked about how they believed they were preserving things and restoring to the land. They actually bulldozed a site that was considered sacred to the Burns Paiute people, um, and they did it to build a latrine. So to you know, add, uh, make it even a little worse than it would have been otherwise. They also put in some new roads and did other improvements. Um, so, you know, there are lots of things you could feel about Malheur, but as an archaeologist, I was outraged that the archaeologist had had her office rifled through, that artifacts had possibly been taken, that redacted site locations, so that means that they've hid, hidden them so pot hunters can't get them, had been uh, exposed to public view and shared, and that sites had actually been destroyed. And meanwhile, you had this group saying that they were going to treat the Native Americans better. Um, and respect their heritage more. So that was kind of, again, a theme of sort of anti-government sentiment when, in which archaeology kind of got caught in the crossfires, and, and that happens pretty frequently. Um, here we have, uh, again, roads and mining and development. This is Nine Mile Canyon. It's sometimes called the largest art gallery in the world, has amazing rock art. Uh, and a lot of that is actually sort of under threat because you have heavy mining and oil extraction industries out there. Uh, the dust from the roads has actually damaged a lot of the panels already, and there have been some interesting agreements. So the Colorado Plateau Archaeological Alliance has tried to work with groups to minimize that and to protect them, and they've had some success in doing it. But basically the general rule is the more roads you put in, the greater the destruction of the sites. Speaking of roads, uh, some of you may remember this lovely episode from a few years ago here in, again, uh, southeastern Utah uh, with Recapture Canyon, where you actually had the county commissioner illegally lead a group which also included the Bundy brothers on a ride on off-road vehicles into Recapture Canyon as a protest to increased regulations from the BLM that were designed to protect the archaeological resources which are shown here and are really abundant in this area. Um, in the process of leading this uh, rally, they actually damaged more archaeological sites, and so they were held accountable and uh, ended up, Lyman in particular, pled guilty. But he is now, there are a number of groups of county commissioners from the state who are trying to get him off scot-free and minimize the uh, payment. So it's kind of sending an interesting message about what our government perhaps feels about the importance of these sources. 
A red, look, little closer to home, Red Cliff Reserve. I worked on a project where we did some archaeological work out there because, again, they wanted to put a road through the middle of the preserve. And so we were trying to demonstrate that there were cultural resources there. Uh, so those are some SEU students working with me a few years ago. But I did mention I wanted to kind of end, because I only have a few more minutes here, on um, some ideas of what... I don't know, what makes the United States a little bit different than some other places in the world I've worked? And what might be some ideas for, for improving things uh, here? How can we get people to care about what I think is an important issue? Um, England, I lived in England for a while, and I have uh, one of my closest colleagues teaches at University College London. And so we spent a lot of time chatting about differences there. And part of it, I think, is that in England, you have a national heritage. Uh, British heritage controls most things. Uh, they really emphasize innovative, creative engagements with the past. And there seems to be a sense where people feel like they have this is their history that they're concerned with, uh, where I don't think we always have that here in the United States in quite the same way. There are also much stronger laws protecting most of the monuments and the archaeological sites than we have here, in part probably because it's a smaller country, a little easier to control. But then they've also done some kind of interesting and innovative things. One th idea I thought was kind of intriguing, tried to create make amateurs into more informed, I guess, uh, participants in the past. So detectorists, who tend to be viewed by most archaeologists with a little bit of fear, because it often leads to pot hunting, were actually welcomed into the archaeological community in England. Uh, and they have the, what they call the portable antiquities scheme. And so people are allowed to keep small, insignificant things like coins they find, because there are a lot of Roman coins uh, scattering the British landscape. Uh, but if they find something more significant, like a Viking horde, they're kind of expected to go and report it to the authorities. And the amazing thing is, is it works. They do. And so all of these artifacts were ones that were voluntarily turned over uh, to the British Museum by these people who participate in the portable antiquity scheme. And then they worked alongside archaeologists to try to preserve the past and learn more about it. So I thought it was kind of an interesting use of local communities and uh, working on that built interest. Peru, where I've spent even more time, has even stronger national protection laws. And I think in part because Peru realizes that this is where their bread is buttered. This is why people come to Peru. They want to see the archaeological resources. But I have to say, this is my goddaughter, uh, Emily. And so I, when I first started working there, she was about six months. Well, she, she'd just been born, so that's her name. And she's now 18. But she's uh, wearing the fancy dress that uh, all the little school kids, in this case, or high school kids go. And they always go to archaeological sites to do their kind of dance performances. And they kind of try to, I guess, bring life back to the archaeological sites. They're not distanced. People know where they are, but they have a living connection with these sites. And that is something that perhaps we don't have here in the United States. Um, so that's one thing. Archaeologists, are there are a lot of them working in Peru. They even have their own day. April 11th is Na National Archaeologist Day, or Day of the Archaeologist. Uh, and people you know, give flowers and gifts to their archaeologists. I don't think that will ever happen here in the United States. I mean, you, know, you, can, you can think about doing that for me if you want to. Uh, but it, again, kind of indicates a rather different attitude, I think, towards the past and the people who are in charge of presenting it. They see it as something that helps them economically, that connects them to their own heritage, and that they want to preserve. And they're very protective of these sites. What about us? Well, <laughs> this again is another image from Nine Mile Canyon. Uh, I, it always makes me angry every time I see it because I think it kind of encapsulates two very different attitudes here. You have somebody who said, this is private property, no trespassing, stenciled right across Fremont rock art. That was presumably done by the European, first uh, some of the Euro European settlers from the 1930s in there. And then most of the little antiquity signs, A, are pretty old in that whole area, and then they've been shot up. Uh, so that's, a pretty, that's one of the better preserved ones in that area. So here, I think we don't see, for the most part, many of us, a connection with the past because we view it as other, as Native American, as not something that is ours. And that leads to perhaps a disregard for it, in a way. Um, also, I, I don't know, there's an interesting argument by Charles Mann and some other scholars who suggest that the notion of a pristine wilderness, an empty wilderness, was tremendously appealing to the Europeans when they first arrived in the Americas because it made it easier to conquer the land and to fill it if they viewed it as empty of people, even though it wasn't. 
there were very large settlements here with hundreds of thousands of people. Some of the cities in the Americas were bigger than cities in Europe at the time. But that is not recorded in our national myth. Manifest destiny, moving into continually empty land and improving it, putting up fences, marking off with private boundaries. That's what we think should be done to land. And I think, it, again, it's easier to do that sometimes if you forget that there's another history there underlying it, one that maybe predates your own history. So again, the question is, well, how do we uh, fight that? And I don't know. I'm just going to end it here by mentioning there are some cool programs on. We have like uh, the archaeology project. Sam Kirkley on campus tries to go into the schools and educate people. We have the Archaeological Conservancy, which is trying to protect archaeological sites by buying them and actually privatizing them in order to protect them. We have people pushing about back against legislative changes or trying to introduce new legislation. Uh, but ideas, what, what else could we be doing to try to uh, convince people that this is something that's worth saving? Because at this rate of destruction, I have to say, you know, I'm a little worried that we're not going to have a lot of the past left for the future generations. Um, and that bothers me deeply as an archaeologist. That's part of my stewardship responsibility. And it just sometimes seems like people don't care. So I don't know. And any thoughts on that before we just fall into an abyss of despair? Emin. Yeah. <laughs> help cultivate that connection with the history. If we could partner with some of the descendants of these mm -hmm. people, the native people um, who do share that history yes. um, and have them share their stories, have them talk about significant places to them, uh, their people, uh, perhaps that would humanize a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. We could have that connection that we don't hurt. I think that's a great idea, and there is a growing uh, trend towards community archaeology, which does emphasize working with descendant communities. So I think that's a great idea. Harry. Mm -hmm. I've got a question. Sure. It's really disturbing uh, mm -hmm. in restoration. Uh, I know it's a fine line between restoration and destruction. And I think, in particular, a couple of years ago, we went out to mm -hmm. Mount Lion, yeah. and I was disturbed by the restoration of the precedents there. Yeah. Uh, what's your thought on that? Well, um, kind of mixed. I, in general, I think uh, I advocate for conservation rather than restoration, if that makes sense. So you're trying to conserve what's already there rather than to rebuild it. Um, but uh, other than that, I think it's hard if a group actually has a living connection to that site and believes that it needs to be maintained. I'm not going to go say you can't do that. Um, I feel like that's where we sometimes maybe overstep our bounds as archaeologists or scientists because some of that restoration was actually, as I understand it, uh, some of the Paiute were involved in that and that was a site that was important to them and to their ancestors. So I feel like that's something we also need to recognize. Uh, that just when something's archaeology doesn't mean it doesn't continue to have a role to play in the present. But you know, then you get into dif difficult questions of who has more of a right to do that than others. So. Well, anyway, I know with time is up. I have filled my 30 minutes and slightly over, so I apologize for keeping you on. But thank you for letting me uh, share my anger and concerns with you. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, yeah, feel free to come on up and ask me afterwards. And enjoy the rest of Festivus. 